So in this particular video slide, I will be talking about database development modeling. Um, this is an important um, area for us as we start to learn about how to model databases. Um, the contents that will be covered is the database development process. Um, in this slide, I've included a link um, and I'm also going to include this in the D2L um, content folder so you can directly click on it and open the chapter 13. I'm going to open this chapter quickly for you. This is the chapter that we will be covering in this video slide. It's chapter number 13. It's called the database development process. And this talks about the different systematic steps that we can take as we are developing a database. It is very similar and follows a very similar approach to the software development life cycle. Um, so please use this as a resource as you're reading further. Um, so a core aspect of the database development um, process is to break the process into a series of phases or steps. And the collection of the steps is also referred to as the software development lifecycle or SDLC. If you're taking the software development one class, you will definitely go through this process. Um, and this is very similar to the steps that we will be following to learn about the database lifecycle model as well. Um, this is an example of the waterfall model, which is one of the very old and um, more hierarchical approach that is used in software development lifecycle. It follows a very systematic approach, as you can see here, as one step leads into the other. Um, the database lifecycle, we can think of it as consisting of the following major phases, the requirements gathering. In this phase, what we are technically doing is we are trying to understand what is the purpose of this database? So in order to understand the purpose of the database, we need to interview the different stakeholders that will be using the database in the organization. So this can be a wide variety of user groups. Uh, we need to establish requirements, document why, what kind of data we are going to use. So this gives us a first handle. So if you go back and recollect the what you were doing in your database project milestone one, you were pretty much doing a requirements gathering phase. Of course, we did not step into a real environment where you had to make a lot of different assumptions, but you pretty much documented what was the purpose of your database and what kind of data you thought um, your database was going to keep track of. So that is pretty much your requirements gathering stage. After that, we move into the analysis stage where we are trying to build a conceptual data model. Uh, we're giving detailed descriptions for the data. What is the type of data that we're going to store? What's the focus of this data? Uh, what type of uh, why is this data going to be used? This is what we're doing in our analysis stage. And then we move to the logical design stage where we are building the data model. In this ca case, we are actually thinking what are the different types of tables we would need. This is not something that we are actually building, but we are modeling it. And in this phase of the database course, what you're learning, the data modeling really res rests in the analysis and logical design stage. It's important to understand that the logical design is database management system independent. Um, it doesn't matter what type of database management system you're going to use. You can still scale your logical design to whichever DBMS. So we have learned and we have looked at some examples of DBMSs such as Oracle, Microsoft. In this class, we are specifically using MySQL. So these are examples of database management systems. And it doesn't matter which database management system you're using. The logical design is pretty much independent of the particular database management system that you're using. And then we move into the implementation stage. This is where we are constructing the database according to the logical schema. So this particular stage is database management system dependent. We are thinking about what type of database management system are we going to implement this model in. Storage is important. We try to enforce security here. Who is going to have access? How can we restrict control? How can we make sure that the data that we are putting in the database is secure? Um, and aspects like this is what we're concerned with. And then we move into realizing the design where we take um, the tables, we look at the different fields, and then we start writing our SQL DDL statements to create the database structure. So keep in mind that realizing the design is where we are taking that model we have decided which database management system we are going to use in the implementation stage, and then we are realizing it or making it become happen 
in that database management system. Um, so it is also at this stage that we do our create statements. Now keep in mind that you don't always have to write code. Many DBMS have built in graphical user interface structures. And we have looked at some of those in our MySQL lab that we did very early in the semester, but we could take that step and as well write SQL code for it. Finally, we move to the populating the database. Um, and this is where we take our data and we import it into the database or we create new database for it. So this would be our insert statements that we write to populate the database. So these are some of the major steps. I just wanna go over it again. You have requirements gathering, analysis, logical design, implementation, realizing the design and population of the database. So these steps are important for you to understand in this introduction to database class. So make sure that you're going over these different steps so you have a handle of what exactly happens in these different stages. And we do follow the systematic approach because these steps are very important. You don't wanna rush through any step uh, because if you don't go through this systematically, we would have to go back and make a lot of unnecessary changes which can be very difficult at times to maintain and manage. Business rules, again, keep in mind that databases are very closely tied with um, the business aspects of the organization because what we're trying to do is we're trying to create a system that makes the business processes um, go strategically smoother. So a lot of the rules that we add into the database are based upon the business rules of the organization. So you cannot say that this is a rule that only works in this area. It really depends upon the business aspect of the organization. So business rules shape the design of the database. It's specific to the organization and it arises from the business policies and practices that are followed in a particular organization. So what works in one organization might not be what happens in another. So we have to keep these assumptions and rules in mind. So this goes back again to the project. Like when you are doing your creating your database, you got to think about what might be some specific rules um, that you want to follow in your organization. And this would really help you with creating your different fields and adding uh, different rules to your database structure. So what are some examples of a business rule? So if you're thinking in the context of an academic database, these are some examples of business rules. Student must declare a major before enrolling in a class. So this could be a rule which I'm not saying this is followed at GGC, but a certain educational institution can say that if a student is trying to enroll in a co-course without declaring a major, the system would prevent that from happening. No advisor can have more than 25 mentees. This is another example of a rule. Students may declare one or two, but not more than two majors. Um, prerequisites must be satisfied before enrolling in a course. So some of these examples you might have encountered, for example, if you're trying to go into Banner and enroll into a course that you have not satisfied the prerequisites for, you see how the system would prevent you from completing that steps. So these are some examples that I've given you and we're gonna think about these kinds of rules as we're creating our databases as well. What are some of the business rules? What are some business assumptions that we have to keep in mind? The entity relationship data model or the ER has existed for over 35 years. It's well suited for the use with database. So this is more a way, a process for us to prototype a database. So just in your programming classes, when you had to work on writing larger programs, a flow chart was always helpful. You can think of an ER model to be very similar to a flow chart. ER modeling is based on two concepts. We have entities, and these are our tables that are going to hold the specific information. And we also define relationships. And these are the associations or interactions that happen between the entities. So let's look at an entity. It's an object. It mimics something in the real world that can actually exist, or it could be something that's conceptual. For example, a course, a job, a position. Attributes. So attributes, again, this should be a review because we have talked about this, that for every table you have different attributes, a set of attributes that define what exactly you want to keep track of. So as you can look here, we have employee as an entity, and then you have name, address, birth date, and salary, and these are the attributes that are associated with this particular entity. Who decides these attributes? It really stems from the business need. 
what does an organization want to keep track of about an employee? That's how we define what these attributes are. Now we are going to look at the different types of attributes. We have simple attributes and these are drawn from the atomic value do domains. They are single valued. Um, for example, name, a person's name, age. These are simple attributes because they are single valued. Or you can also have composite attributes. For example, address. Address co consists of number, street, state, zip code. So that would be considered a composite attribute because it consists of more than one um, aspect that it's holding together. Um, you can also have multi-valued attributes and these have a set um, values for a particular entity. For ex example, it could be a company database as we can see here and we have employee and degree can be multi-valued. So a person could have a bachelor's degree, a master's degree and a PhD. So it could be a multi-valued attribute which consists of more than one. We also have derived attributes and these are attributes that contains values that are calculated from other attributes. So as you can see here, for example, you can think of a person's age being calculated from their birth date because for example, every year you know that how an age trap keeps moving forward and that is really dependent on your birth date. So if you want to add an attribute called age, it could be derived from another attribute such as birth date. So these are some examples of attributes. In this class, we are more focused on an introductory class. So the attribute that we will be mainly focusing on, and especially in your project, would be simple attributes. These are atomic value domains.